In this unit, we're thinking about the material theater of ancient Greece, that is, the buildings, the costumes, uh, the special effects, uh, the scenery, the things that actually physically made the theater work. And the very first thing we want to think about is the physical spaces. When we think about ancient Greece, we often think about those wonderful, huge stone theaters, and I confess that I also like to show pictures of those. But the fact is that the theater, well into the classical era, looked something much more like this, a very simple circle, a, a sort of what they called a threshing circle, a dancing space, next to a hillside, and beside that, an altar, uh, and a temple for Dionysus. It was almost completely blank and almost completely devoid of scenery. The very first of these theaters, the oldest of these theaters, like the one that is still extant at Thorikos, actually had a square playing area in front. We call it a dancing circle because it usually was circular. But in this case, the orchestra, that space in the center where the dancing took place, as you can tell, is actually square. And we have every reason to think that in all of the oldest theaters, it was square. And the seating area, as you can see uh, above it, did curve around the edges, but was much closer to what we think of as a modern auditorium. Much later, in the Hellenistic period, we began to develop these big, beautiful buildings, the skina, from which we take our word scene, uh, behind the dancing area, big elaborate playing spaces. But the truth is that this was 100, 150 years after the classical period before these began to appear. Here we have some of those leftover uh, extant theaters. You can see some here, like the one from Delphi and the very famous one at Epidavros. Uh, you can even see the detail of the Theater of Dionysus as it now looks in Athens. But I want to remind you that these are much later developments. They were not this uh, organized and particularly the stone auditoriums did not exist in the classical period. If you look at the drawing at the bottom, and especially you look at that big red area in the middle, that's the area that we call the dancing circle. And the Greek word for that was orchestra. We now use that to mean in many auditoriums the prime seats, the seats on the floor, the seats right in front, because seats have been filled into that area. But no one sat there during the Greek period because that's where they uh, actually performed. Much later in history, they began to put the musicians in that area in front of the performance, often down in a pit, but that's where we get our modern word orchestra to mean a large group of musicians. It's really from this area in the middle of the Greek theater called the orchestra, which means dancing circle. Around that, now in stone, but originally made out of wood in bleachers, was the area that the audience sat to watch the performance. We now call this area the auditorium, which means the hearing place. But the Greeks called it the theatron, the seeing place. You can sort of see at the beginning of that, the the theatron eventually became our word see, the seeing place, where the audience sat to watch the performance. And here's that same drawing, but you can see it colored in in red to identify where the theatron is. The Theatron was divided into sections, little web wedge-shaped seating areas, which were reserved for members of specific tribes 
when the city used this space as a as a public meeting space the for the democracy the voting of the time people sat organized by their tribes and we think even at performances they sat organized by their tribes in these wedged shaped seating areas the carcass and on the other side the little stairways that go up through the the auditorium the climaches uh, which is simply what we would now call the aisle. I want you to pay particular attention to the building at the back here, the skene, uh, S-K-E-N-E. It's that building is what we would now call the scene, the scenery, S-C-E-N-E, but it originally was a word that meant tent. So we think all the way into the classical period, for all of the plays that we are going to read, there wasn't a physical building sit back, sitting back there, but only a temporary structure, a tent, or that word would not have lasted quite so long. Eventually, they built a structure, which you can see here colored in red, in front of the skene, which was called the pro skenian the thing in front of the Skene, from which we take our word proscenium, which still means the thing in front of the scenery, the frame in front of the scenery. You can see that it was a half-sized uh, building, and on top of it, the logeon, the place where gods could speak looking down on the chorus, or occasionally actors who were officials, playing officials, kings, etc., were up on the logeon which was just the roof of the Proscanian. To the sides of the theater, in, in between the Skene and the uh, Theatron, the auditorium, were two side entrances. This is how the audience actually came into the auditorium to take their seats, and it's where the chorus also made its entrance in. This area is called the Parados, from our, which we now make into the word parade. And parados also means the opening chorus of a play because the chorus is coming in through this area, the parados. In the middle of the theater was a thimile, or altar. We don't know what the thimile looked like in this time, and there's an awful lot of discussion about people standing on top of the thimile or taking refuge on top of the thimile, that is, um, actually getting on top of the altar. So it may have looked something like this, a kind of table that somebody could crawl up on, but it's possible that it was much lower, just a small platform, uh, six or, or, or so inches tall. It doesn't really matter that it was table-like as long as it was recognized as a, a sacred and religious area. But to our shock, the thimile was not removable. It did not go away. Whatever it was, it sat right in the middle of the dancing circle, right in the middle of the performance. So probably the absolute prime spot in the theater, the center space, was reserved for some kind of religious-related a thematic material. So when we look at those big auditoriums and we think about almost the entire population of a Greek city coming and sitting to watch performance, it makes us wonder about Greek audiences. We know some things about the audiences. We know that they were seated by tribes. We know that the metics, the resident aliens, that is, residents of the city who were not born in the area, born in Athens, had to sit in the upper level. They were removed towards the back so that citizens could sit in the front. What we don't know is whether or not there were women present. There are some stories about the entrance of the Furies, for instance, uh, in the humanities, being so frightening that women had miscarriages. That would make us think that there were women in the audience. Was it not so obvious that the story is already an exaggeration? Um, 
a, a kind of extravagant statement of how frightening things were. So, because the story is obviously made up, we can't tell if the detail that there were women present was made up. We know that there were not women on stage. What we don't know is if there were women in the audience. Um, uh, it's, it's a factor still under debate by critics and historians. We know that late in the classical period, there began to be a lot of stage machinery involved, and those were especially involved for the entrance of gods and what would we, we would call reveals, the sudden revelation of something that has previously been hidden or off stage. Gods, the deos, um, were lowered in, flew in, on some kind of crane, um, a machine that lowered in the gods, which was called literally God in a Machine, Deus Ex Machina. Um, we now use Deus Ex Machina to mean a sudden and unprepared in, uh, uh, solution to a play, an entrance of a god at the very end of a play, or just any kind of, of made-up solution which was not prepared for earlier in the play. That is, we use it as an insult. But the Greeks often resolved their plays by the entrance of a god, which they thought of as an epiphany. It was the religious experience that they were there for. Another kind of machine was the ekaklima. The ekaklima was a, a rolling platform of some kind, often used to reveal the corpses of, of characters that had died or been murdered off stage. In ancient Greece, almost the opposite of contemporary theater, they put lots of sexuality on stage, but always kept the violence off stage. Um, we don't know how the ekaklima worked. Here's a couple of drawings that think about how it may have happened. One is a revolving stage and one is just a rolling platform. But we know that the ekaklima was used for reveals. We also know that uh, uh, in the classical period and on into the Hellenistic period, actors wore masks. There were two practical reasons for this. One is, in the early theater, we were still trying to help the audience understand that the actor was separate from the character. And one way to do that is put a mask on his face so that we couldn't identify the actor as a person. We could only identify his character. But also, surprisingly, in the Greek theater, there were only three actors, and they would go off stage and change into another character and come back. So masks help them make the distinction between characters. And when we really map out classical plays, we realize that the actor who went off in one costume, put on a mask and a costume, and then came back on, was not available sometimes for the re-entrance of the original character. That is, more than one actor may have played the same character in the course of a play, so they needed the mask and the costume to identify the character, not the person that was inside those things. Here are some contemporary versions of Greek masks. Uh, the famous one from Sir, Kurt, Sir Tyrone Guthrie's performance of Oedipus Rex, this is available on our class page for you to watch completely, and some other masks uh, of Greek chorus members. Uh, and again, even more masks here, all from contemporary mask makers. Characters also wore kothornai, a kind of sandal which during the classical period were built up like with wedges so to make the actor a great deal taller and the oikos, a kind of elaborate wig. So here's an example of the kathornai, uh, the shoes there, and you can see the wedge platform. Eventually, by the end of the Hellenistic period, these got as tall as a foot uh, of, of wedge. And there you see masks with the elaborate wigs attached over the top of them, the oikos, which also helped add height and give the actor some stature but also helped um, 
uh, soften the edges of the mask and make it seem not so artificial on the face of the actor. Uh, just a reminder that the ancient Greek theater was sung or chanted throughout. It was musical, and it contained a great deal of dance as well. Whenever we see pictures of it, we see pictures of dancers and musicians. Uh, and we always have to bear in mind that part of the effect of ancient Greek theater must have been more like a modern musical than what we now think of as the Victorian uh, intoned beautiful performances. Uh, they, were, they were much more lively than that. We know that these uh, performances were marketed by an elaborate parade announcing the start of the festival that wound through the precincts of the city uh, and ended in the theater on which at which point on this first day of the festival the plays that to that were to follow were announced these plays were these uh, parades were Dionysian in context. You can see a picture of one here, a much later painting of one, um, with the god Bacchus, the god of wine, on top of the cart that's being drawn forward there. Parades remained a major form of marketing until well into the 20th century. We still think of circuses, having circus parades through the town to announce their presence. But it's the oldest form of marketing. It's the way, it, especially in pre-literate societies, people knew that theater was coming to their town. And these festivals, these performances of plays, were always competitive. Uh, plays were chosen, three playwrights were chosen to present plays each year by the elected officials. But once the performances took place, the audience actually voted. They voted in a very odd way, we would think. Um, each of section of the audience, by uh, in those seated in those wedges, voted independently of every other section. And all of the people in that section of the audience dropped a colored pebble, black, white, or red, depending on which play they were voting for. But when all was said and done, one representative of that section of the audience, that tribe, reached in and drew out only a single pebble. Those 12 representatives then went down on stage and dropped the pebble that they had drawn into a large urn. And again, pebbles were drawn, and only one determined the winner. Now, we may think of that as a very odd way of voting because it leaves so much to chance, but the Greeks actually did that on purpose because they didn't want it to be strictly a vote of the audience. They wanted the gods to have a chance to vote also, so they built in the element of chance. Of course, if the audience overwhelmingly favored a single play, the odds are that that colored pebble will be the one eventually drawn. But it was never perfectly true. That's why we need to be very careful of the odd statements about, can you believe that uh, Oedipus Rex, for instance, did not win the competition in the year that it, it uh, was first performed, even though everyone thought of it as the greatest play of the ancient world. What we really might say is, hmm, I guess the gods voted against it. So that's a quick overview of the physical theater of that time. We'll go on in this class to talk about plays in this period, especially Agamemnon, Oedipus the King, and the Trojan Women. And when we move forward uh, to comedy, we'll talk about the frogs. That's a place to get us started, though. I hope you find this helpful. Thanks.